start if you like to. Ah, okay. Uh, thank you. And uh, first of all, thank you for uh, inviting for this uh, beautiful meeting. Uh, I would like to say firstly to Jeanette and everyone who is here. And uh, we will talk about uh, natural farming of uh, Masanobu Fukuoka. Uh, firstly, I would like to introduce myself. And uh, at some point, if you have any question or uh, if there are any points that you would like to underline, I would be happy also to hear uh, from you. Uh, and we can also see some pictures from uh, some applied examples as well. Uh, me, myself, I have, uh, after I read the book of Masanabu Fukuoka, which is called One Straw Revolution, I was very impressed and uh, it seemed to me actually not even real that uh, that <laughs> it was way more than growing uh, just food, but it was there was a philosophy behind natural farming, like an ocean behind uh, growing the food. And uh, I wa I wanted to go deeper in this way. I will I wanted to see with my own eyes how that is possible. And uh, I discovered that there was uh, Panos Manikis in uh, north, northern Greece, in Edessa. In uh, 2014, I went to visit him first time. And, uh, but still, I wanted to travel uh, in the other natural farms, see different, in the different climates, in different places. And he gave me some contacts in uh, South America. And uh, also, there are many different climates, so I choose to go to South America rather than the India, although there are many more natural farms in India. And uh, I have traveled uh, around two years, <coughs> sorry, in uh, South America, visited the farm of the people who have been with uh, Masonobu Fukuoka in Japan. And uh, in 2016, I came back, I turned back to Europe, and uh, contacted again with Panos and uh, came to Edessa again. And uh, he was in the end of, let's say, towards the end of his farming life, because he was quite old in that time. And uh, he passed me the half of the farm, uh, I bought it. And uh, last year I leave this part of the farm to an association in order to establish more natural farms uh, around the world and uh, organize uh, seedings with uh, seed balls that we will also talk now, the idea of uh, seed balls. Maybe some of you already heard about it. And uh, natural farming of uh, Masanobu Fukuoka, it is called also, yeah, it's, uh, it is called, all, yeah, this book is really, I think one of the, where he is really reaching an enlightenment point and he, he opens a lot of doors in the human mind, I think. Beautiful. I'll just show the book for anybody who is interested. It's a wonderful book. So you could see it. It is also called uh, Do Nothing Farming. Uh, maybe some of you haven't uh, heard about it. Uh, but please don't confuse with Do Nothing Farming with Abandoning the Land. They are uh, two different aspects. Uh, this do nothing, it is not not being at present in the farm or in your field. I have met 11 uh, farmers that were with Fukuoka and 11 of them, they were present at their farm from morning till the, like from morning sun to the evening sun, seven days uh, without any break. But they were just present, like an animal being present in a farm, like a chicken walking around the farm and simply living. He, a chicken never works you know, in the farm, but simply lives. And each action that a chicken is doing, it is contributing the fertility of the soil. And all these people, they were on this path. Basically, they were not working, but each action that they were doing while they were being present in their farm, it was these actions were offering to the fertility of the soil. And uh, these principles of natural farming, if we want to see in the perspective of the farming, we are talking of no tilling the soil, 
no plowing and uh, not using any kind of fertilizers, pesticides, no uh, herbicides as well. And we are talking about not cutting the grasses, not touching. And if we are talking about also the fruit trees, we are not also pruning the fruit trees. So it is living to the nature to do it is on uh, path, let's say in a sim simple way. But of course, this is a process, maybe a few thousand years ago, it was already, we didn't even need to do anything. We didn't even need the idea of natural farming because it was naturally there, existing naturally. But as a human beings, we are plowing the soil more than 15,000 years and using more than 200 years all these chemicals in the agriculture and we arrive to the point that the soil doesn't have any more this fertility every year the farmers have to use more products in order to produce in order to grow food they plow the soil they use chemicals potions and then next year in order to grow again they have to use again these uh, products it is like a dog trying to bite his own uh, uh, how do you call it? the coda unfortunately this is the reality of the agriculture of today uh, i see that ellen i think you wanted to say something no no i was wagging a tail ah, tail yes. dog chasing his own tail thank you yes and uh, in this way of farming, it is simply Fukuoka has to came the idea of uh, seed balls. Maybe you have heard about it. Uh, it is very associated with Fukuoka, the seed balls. We can use them in the farm, grow food, offer the fertility, and also for the reforestation. That is really excellent and rejecting the whole human knowledge putting on a site and uh, simply mixing all the seeds that is uh, growing in the area without even thinking where to plant which tree and mix the seeds with the clay and uh, make them a shape of a ball and uh, throw them randomly wherever uh, you like to throw and uh, when the rain season arrives the seeds start germinating and nature will choose uh, which plants grow in which point and uh, it will take care of the, the rest. You don't need to even uh, plant a garden, let's say, or a forest. But of course, this doesn't happen one day to another. This is a process that we have to awake the soil. This will happen step by step, like uh, growing a child. When, when, the, when a child is a baby, we cannot talk about being autonomous. We cannot talk about being self-sufficient. We, we have to stay behind till arrive, this child arrives to a maturity. And only after that point, we can talk about not doing, let's say. But uh, this, is, this will happen only step by step. And uh, what are those steps if you if you would like to talk, uh, if you would like to talk, I would like to first ask you if there are any gardeners, if there are people uh, growing food, uh, even in a small scale, like 100 square meter area. Nice. I'm very happy to do that. And uh, I believe that you are all in Israel in a very hot climate, no? Not all of us, many of us are here in Israel, not everybody. Also, my good friend Clara is a gardener. If, uh, if that is okay, I would like to show you some pictures of an example of a vegetable garden, 100 square meter of vegetable garden in the island of Sicily that is going on more than uh, three years now. And in this garden there has never been the soil uh, that like there has never been a movement in the soil. We never touched the soil. We didn't plow. We never used any kind of uh, fertilizers or any kind of manure compost. And the uh, grasses were never being cut. It is simply the straw and hay mix laid on the soil. A good 
layer of straw and hay mix laid on the soil. And then we started uh, planting. And out of this 100 square meter of the vegetable garden, in every year, there is more than 500 kilograms of the natural fruits are growing. It is unbelievable. And it has never been watered as well. Like there is no water used in this uh, way of gardening. And in a climate of a uh, Sicily, like very hard, almost uh, desert climate, I could say. More than six, seven months, there are no rainfalls. And uh, even in the rainy months, there are very few uh, rains. And the temperatures these days in the island raised more than uh, 45 degrees. They are about 45 degrees. The farmers, the traditional uh, farmers, they have to irrigate their farm morning and the evening, two times a day, because it is unbelievably hot. And then the wind comes from Africa as well. But in the way of natural farming, now we will see the pictures. There has never been used any water. Besides, there is a very big scale of uh, harvest. Are we talking then about dry farming, would you say? Uh, we can think that we can think in this way, dry farming, but uh, the idea is, I wouldn't even call it as a dry farming. I would call it awakening the soil. Like once the soil is awake, there is no terminate, there is no need even to call that it is a dry farming or it is a wet farming because the water is naturally exist already in the soil. When it rains during the winter months, the water enters in the soil. And if there is a good vegetation on the soil, there is no need to irrigate. This is how the nature works. In winter months, it rains, and this water is used in the summer months for the plants. But we have the soil has to be covered in this how case. This how did you do the planting there? Did you do it with seed balls? Both. In the first year, uh, we did transplanting. In the second year, there were transplanting and the seed balls. And the third year, uh, it is coming now. This is the third year again with the seed balls and transplanting. And then there is a one small part that is growing only with the seed balls. And there is still another part which we don't even throw the seed balls, but uh, the plants, when they go to seeds, they throw their own seeds and then uh, they, they come again the next year. There is, a, there is a symbiotic relation. There are certain type of, type of uh, fungus in the soil that, that are just activate, activated. If a plant goes to a seed, goes to flower and mature its seed, and the same fungus helps. They, they, are, they are present in the soil if, if there are plants that are going to seeds. And the same fungus is helping for the germination in the moment of there are seeds to germinate. So after second year or third year of transplanting, we arrive to a point that we don't even need to transplant anymore. Of course, this is about each person. If uh, a person likes simply leave everything to the nature and just enter the place and pick whatever there is, <laughs> which is very possible, or if one likes to make in a, in a little bit of order, maybe here is a tomato row, here is a zucchini plant, that is also possible. But the whole idea behind of natural farming is letting the nature to do its own work and awakening the soil. So if that is okay, let's have a look at the pictures of this vegetable garden. Maybe we can talk uh, about uh, seed balls and uh, do nothing afterwards. Uh, just a second. Let's start from the beginning. Okay. Everyone is able to see clearly. Okay. This is the this is a natural farm. 
that is uh, going on more than seven, eight years, but the uh, vegetable garden is just uh, created three years ago because uh, the farmers started to be more present in the farm, let's say. And here you will see the steps. This area, it is now a vegetable garden and we will see the preparing process. And here you see the mix straw and hay. And uh, at the beginning, we didn't even cut the grass. There is this cylinder like, I don't know, it is, I don't know how do you even call it. We just passed with it on the surface of the soil. So the grasses were broken and lie down on the ground. And hay and straw, we just put it on the surface of the soil. This is the process. And all this preparation of around 100 square meter of vegetable garden didn't take more than uh, two hours of human work, let's say. You can see the process simply lying the straw and hay on the soil. That round tube, was that to keep the borders? Was that its purpose? This is, no, in order to break the grasses. Otherwise they were too tall. And if you oh. would have laid the straw and hay on the grasses, probably they would have lift the mulch. I so we just pass the area with this tool. It is not even a tool, it is like a cylinder like and then uh, lay the mulch. But uh, the key point is there is a very thick layer of mulch around uh, 20 centimeters. This is very essential if you like to grow food uh, without irrigating, without watering. And if you like to have no weeding, this is very essential. Two, three, four, five centimeters of mulch is not a mulch. And, and what is the green that's coming up here in the middle? This is a fennel, I think. Right, so that doesn't matter that it's covered or not covered? No, this was already there, like it is, now we will see the next steps. Uh, this, I think it was even wild fennel that see the- Yeah, I have a lot of wild fennel. <laughs> have a problem with the pictures. This is uh, when it is complete. Same area. And this is basically the, our vegetable garden, uh, let's say. And in order to plant, we just move the mulch, as you see here, and uh, transplant it. This is the first year. This is still the first year. As you see now, after we move and transplant it and then put back the mulch. This is the panel that we have seen in the middle. The lettuces. This is the second year of the garden. And uh, till now, there has never been only work that was done by the human was basically apart from creating the vegetable garden was just transplanting in the first years, which took around one to two hours of human work in the spring and the autumn season. What do you do about uh, deer and rabbits? Uh, deer and rabbits, they are not very present in the island of the Sicily. We had a lot of uh, issues with, with snails. Uh, but and uh, small uh, mice, but rabbits, they were not really present in the area and the deer as well. So this was the, I would like to show also the pictures from this year, the harvest. Yeah. This, uh, these pictures are from uh, this year, just a few weeks ago.
you can see the tomatoes and they are on full flowering. And here in the back, you can see some cabbages, they go to flower, and onions. And please look at it also, how healthy the plants are without any human interaction. Cucumbers, although they are a plants loving water, like we don't have the water, it is not a choice, it is simply we don't have the source of water, we cannot irrigate it. Still, everything grows in a healthy way. This picture is explaining maybe the idea of how thick the mulch layer is. Maybe if you look at it, uh, like although it might seem very thick layer of mulch and it is, but this is an essential step if you like to grow without any human work. When you transplant, you just lay it on the dirt. You don't, you don't dig up the dirt to put it inside? You just separate the mulch like this, as you see in this picture. And then and just that, lay it down? And then transplant in the soil. You, you do make a little hole to put the plant in. Well, it is not even a hole because the soil is continuously wet. It is always humid. It never gets hard. Like you don't need a tool. You just with your hand move the soil surface like this and uh -huh. put the plant and then cover it. That's it. That is how, how mature are the transplants that you put in? How old are they? How old are they? Uh, how large are the transplants that you put in? How large? I don't understand in uh, what term. They grow from a seed and then they develop. So how big were they when you put them in? This is the after two weeks, maybe after 10 days of transplanting the lettuces. For example, the normally tomato or a pepper plant, normally we transplant them in this uh, height around 15 to 20 centimeters. Because uh, if they were shorter or younger, the plants, we had issues of the snails because they love the young plants. So we decided to wait a little bit longer to transplant and uh, yeah, around the 20 centimeter is a very good growth for transplanting. And this is an Italian variety of tomato called uh, Vesuviano, you know, the volcano comes from the Napoli area. Yes, as you see, there is not a there is no need of weeding because the surface of the soil is continuously covered with a thick layer of mulch. And there are only actually a few plants that can survive under such a layer of mulch. And if you saw also a little bit seed of clover as uh, Foucault also, Foucault also you was using a lot in his uh, way of farming. You don't need to even deal with these four or five type of plants that can uh, survive under such a thick layer of mulch. And once this vegetable garden is established to maintain, maintain it, it is not a, I think it is not a weekly even work, like just in the spring and the autumn months, a few hours of work in a week, and that's it. In the other times, you can simply go away and come even after two weeks. There is no human need to be present in this, in this garden. Yeah, the pictures are uh, finished like this. Uh. Uh, if you have any question, I see that we have time is already we almost at 25 minutes. So if you have any question, I would be happy also to go with the questions. So how did the transplants begin? Did you grow them from seed? And yes, 
two boxes. We make our seedling and then uh, when they reach a certain height and then we transplant. Uh, I see a question. Do you need to water when transplant occurs at all? Yes, when in the moment of transplanting, that is not necessarily, but it might be that there is a need of uh, watering because what is happening is that when we take out our plants, small plants, it has this, this compact soil has a certain uh, number of a uh, humidity, certain percentage of a hum humidity, and it is very compact because the roots are holding it in a very strong way. And when we put it in the soil, they have a different consistency, these two types of the soil. So in the first moment, if it is a hot day or if it is a day that let's say that we didn't have rain after maybe more than 10 days, then in that moment, first time, or only time and the last time we water. Uh, otherwise, there is no need of any watering. Another question I see for tomatoes. I see that they are supported against a group of poles or fences. How often does that have to be adjusted? That is uh, every year. Like if you like to grow a tomato in this section, we just create this uh, poles and we plant the tomatoes. And the next year, maybe end of the season, if we like to make the winter garden, maybe we take them and we plant the winter vegetables and in spring again, like this is the this is basically the only part that where we as a human have to do something. Let's say when in the moment of transplanting, or if we want to decide, I would like to grow tomato here in this way, and we have to create these uh, small structures. Let's say. So you put down new mulch every spring. This is uh, the first year. It is happening like this. Uh, the in the 20 centimeter of the mulch, the soil, let's say in a term of the soil eats the mulch. It makes its own compost directly on the surface of the soil. This is not a mulch. This is like we are letting the soil to make its own compost directly on where, it is, where the place is. And in the first year, it consumed around 10 centimeter. So oh. half of it were consumed. And the second year, this consumption was around uh, maybe eight to nine centimeters, so almost again, like to nine, almost again, the half we have, uh, the soil was consumed, the mulch was consumed by the soil. And the third year, it was only five centimeters of the mulch was uh, consumed, because the more the fertility comes back to soil, the less the mulching process or the composting process is uh, going on because it arrives already a certain fertility. So every spring you're putting down new straw and hay? Hay from weeds, will they grow more weeds? That is a very beautiful question. I don't know who asked it, but thank you, Sarah. Uh, the characteristic of the hay, Actually, the straw and hay, they are a little bit different if you look at it in the characteristic. I would like to explain it quickly also that part to make it clear. The straw, first of all, is a monoculture of a cereals, let's say like this. It can be a rice, it can be millet, it can be any kind of cereals, uh, but it is a monoculture plantation. And the hay is planted by the animal, for the animals, by farmers as an animal food. So it is around 10 to 20 different plants that is mixed. And they are very rich of the proteins and amino acids because farmers are cultivating them as an animal food. So they are very rich plants. And there are also a lot of wild plants that are already exist in the field. This means that the hay brings a lot of seeds. That is true. Uh, but this is a very big advantage, actually. In the, in the moment of 20 centimeter of mulching, the seeds are falling on the soil, they germinate. And this germination of many plants, basically, they attract a lot of microorganisms in their roots because microorganisms are living on the roots of the plants. They don't live on the surface of the soil randomly. They live in a symbiotic relation with the roots. So the seeds 
that are coming from the hay, they fall on the soil, they germinate, they attract a lot of microorganisms, but they cannot survive under 20 centimeter of mulch. After 10 days, maximum of two weeks without having uh, the sun, without reaching the sun, they die. So this is also somehow blocking the wild grasses to grow because we are sowing a lot of seeds actually by bringing the hay on the surface of the soil. Mm. Thank you, thank you. But if you mulch the hay only five centimeters, for example, then you will find your garden with uh, a lot of uh, <laughs> a lot of weeds. The key point in here is really like very thick layer of mulching, like uh, twenty centimeter of mulching. Mm -hmm. Yes, it might seem as if, um, if you would have asked Fukuoka, "Is it enough like this, or how much hay should I use?" Probably he would have responded more <laughs> <laughs> are dry leaves from trees good the sorry dry leaves yes. from the trees yes yes even we can go to forest take the fallen leaves whatever is there any kind of organic material lay it on the surface of the soil and then cover it with again a mix of straw and hay and then uh, start it, it is even better yes do you put down new straw and hay every year? Uh, first two years, even every six months, let's say. But uh, after the second year, this year we had to add only once. And uh, it was maybe even less than half of the quantity that we had to add in the last years. So it arrived to a point the soil doesn't, con don't, doesn't consume anymore that much the, the mud. <coughs> because it is reaching a certain uh, number of fertility. About organic vegetable compost from the guard, from the kitchen. Uh, I don't hear, sorry. What about organic vegetable compost from the kitchen? Mm -hmm. Very beautiful question again. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> we don't do a compost. Simply, you can just throw the what is coming out from your kitchen on the surface of the mulch and let the nature do everything alone. You don't even need to do compost. Actually, this is even better in the term of, I would like to say something about also do nothing and even making the compost because once we start making steps towards the nature or regenerative agriculture, the human mind works in a way that because we have been educated in this way. We have been educated in a way that our mind has to always look for something to do, something <laughs> to change. When, when a person arrives to a garden and first question is, what do I do now to improve the soil fertility? Like already we start with the wrong step, not a wrong step, but we already start, start with a step not towards the natural farming, let's say. This is also a mental attitude to say that I don't do anything, do nothing, leave it to the nature. But once, if you like to make a compost, a person is making a compost on a corner and thinking that we are making compost. No, we cannot even make a compost. We are simply putting the certain materials together living there and the, le the rest is by rest is done by the nature certain type of insects are entering starting the process and then the bacteria microorganisms they are doing the compost but human the mankind thinks that making compost and with this idea it brings also certain consequences by make by thinking that we are making compost the person thinks that there will be a good harvest. It creates and creates an expectation, and it creates an image that the man is essential, the human is essential in the farming, because he or she is doing the compost. But in the other way, if we leave it to the nature, if we start with the approach of we do nothing, 
I simply offer to the soil fertility my disposal. I am present in my farm and I am just offering to the soil and the soil, the nature is doing its own compost. And day by day, this brings to a point. After the first year, after the second year, every day when you work, take a walk in your garden without having this idea of you do a compost, we do a compost, we are having this interaction. You work and you see a perfection. You see that you don't need to do weeding, you don't need to add any organic material from outside, you don't have to be even present as a human in the farm. And this continuously send inputs to our mind, says that everything is already perfect by its own. You don't need to look for something to do. You don't even need to look for, you don't need to create another action. It is an absolute silent of the mind. It sees the perfection of the nature every day by simply walking in the garden. And the, mi and the mind is silent. And the silent mind, it brings us to the point of do nothing farming and the point of the land awakening and in the same point where the land awakes, the human also awakes. The, the real human, the, the spirit of the human, let's say the real nature of the human also awakes. Because mind is not looking for a situation to make it better, create better, but simply it surrenders to the life. It leaves everything to the life itself. If you have a, I see that we are running out of time. I would like to also leave some space to if any of you would like to well, add something. Well, how did he write such a big book if you're not doing anything except putting straw in hay? What's in the book? That's <laughs> if you look at the books of uh, he has actually many books, not the only yes, one. Yes, one straw revolution. Yes, he poems also. He wrote uh, some poems. He has drawings. He has mandalas also. And uh, if you look at uh, if you read the books of Fukuoka, you will never find an action of the farming. It is like he never talks about do this, do that, or you have to plant this, plant that. Like simply he's opening a new door in the human mind, a new look towards the nature. And it is maybe not possible to explain do nothing philosophy with by words, but he tries to show it from one angle, from another angle, from right to the left, top from bottom so that one might maybe get a little bit of essence of the <laughs> do nothing, let's say. And the rest is about you, of course. If you take steps towards this way, towards nature, you see the path of natural farming. What about, uh, like if, if a tree is sick, if, if something has infested, that doesn't happen. You don't have to. Uh, you don't have to take care of things that go bad. This is this is abandoning the farm. If you say that this tree is sick and I am not creating any action, this is abandoning the farm. This is not right. The farm. Right. They are two different things. But even one step before, the sicknesses they are not coming from the trees. Actually, they come from the soil like we have the immune system and there are present many kinds of viruses and bacteria all the time continuously in the world but one doesn't get sick because has a strong immunity so the same idea for the farm if the soil has enough fertility if the soil is living if the soil is alive these bacteria or viruses they create a perfect ecosystem between them of course, I don't want to talk that there is never a sick disease in the farm. Of course, it happens. Like, there are, there are, there are... like I know with my trees, when the branches cross each other and they block the light, you don't have to do anything about that? 
because probably they are pruned already. So in this case, mm -hmm. you have to keep on pruning. This is yeah. nothing to do. Like if a tree already was uh, pruned once, you have to prune continuously. You cannot leave it. This is abandoning. Oh. But if it grows already in the natural form without any human effect from outside, then in that case, you don't need to, they, this, these branches that come together, this will not happen because it already grows in a natural way. Like it is simply look at the forest and the answer is there. There no one prunes, no one adds fertilizers, but everything is perfect alone. Would you like me to read the uh, table of contents so you know what's in this book? No, I want you to loan me the book. <laughs> I'll read the table of contents. <laughs> I'll just go through it quickly. So the beginning, uh, ailing agriculture in an ailing age. So I guess he's setting the need or the, the basis for it. He starts, man cannot know nature. Then the breakdown of agriculture and the third disappearance of a natural diet. And by the way, the name of the book is The Theory and Practice of Green Philosophy. Then the second section, The Illusion of Natural Science. He starts the errors of human intellect, the fallacies of scientific understanding, and a critique of the laws of agricultural science. Then the third section, the theory of natural farming, um, the merits of natural farming, uh, the four principles of natural farming, which are no cultivation, no fertilizer, no weeding, no pesticides. How should nature be perceived? That's interesting, natural farming for a new age. Then four, the practice of natural farming, starting a natural farm, et cetera. Rice and winter grain, uh, quite a lot to say, fruit trees, vegetables. And finally, the last section, the road man must follow, the natural order, natural farming, and a natural diet, and farming for all. It's perfect for Shmita. Huh. You want to explain? <laughs> we, we, in Judaism, in Judaism, we have certain rules um, connected with, oh, sorry. Oh. Connected, I can't talk. Connected with uh, the growing of food. And one of them is every seven years, we let the land alone we don't dig, we don't weed, we don't do anything, except if there's fruit, we're allowed to pick it like that. So it's a start. It's a beautiful gift of Masanobu Fukuoka to the, the whole world, I think. It's beautiful. Would you like to quickly talk about the seed walls or uh, if I see that we are out of time, there, is, there would be a lot to talk <laughs> Well, we still have a few minutes, why not? Uh, this idea of uh, seed balls it is simply we can use for the reforestation that is taking a very big part of also at the moment that we are trying to organize many seedings in Africa, in the burned forest in the Italian, South Italy, and especially in the Sicily. And uh, I would like to just give two information simply so that things are a, bit, a little bit clear. Uh, the a seeding that we organize with seed balls for the reforestation we had to spend around two to 300 euro for each hectare of burned forest. It's only two to 300 euro, no, almost no cost. And the forest department, uh, they wanted to transplant trees instead of uh, using the seed balls. And they spent more than 25,000 euro for each hectare of reforestation movement. So, there is an enormous sources of energy, money, and the human knowledge is entering in the way that the humanity is going. But if we just let everything the nature do, it is so simple. 
it doesn't have even the cost and it is simply offering to the nature and letting the nature decide all the forest to grow let's say i see a question from karim me myself i am on this path since uh, seven years since 2014 and uh, panos he the farm of panos manikis in uh, greece northern greece Edessa. this farm is going on more than uh, 40 years he has been uh, with fukuoka in japan and he turned back to greece and uh, he established that farm around 40 years ago and uh, i am on this path since uh, seven years Thank you so much. It's just, it's, it's enlightening. It's, it's interesting, of course. It's, it opens our minds. It's so refreshing. It's encouraging. It's, I really appreciate all that you're doing here. Thank you so much for joining us and for speaking to us. Thank you very much. I enjoyed a lot to be here with you. And I see a lot of enthusiasm, enthusiasm in uh, many people's I appreciate it really. I wish that uh, this beautiful gift of Fukuoka can reach to different parts of the world and be applied. Thank you.